Who is Baphomet? <laughs> and what is his relationship to Freemasonry and Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol? I've got the answer, but I don't think you're gonna like it. It's coming up right now on Symbols and Secrets. Welcome to Symbols and Secrets, the viewer's guide to Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol. It is streaming now on PeacockTV.com, or you can grab the Peacock app in your app store. New episodes every Thursday. Great show that follows along Dan Brown's runaway bestseller, follow-up to The Da Vinci Code, The Lost Symbol. Only this time, Robert Langdon is not the older, wiser, sage symbologist that we've come to know. No, this is a young Robert Langdon, and he is searching for his mentor, Peter Solomon. Don't forget to like the video, comment below, share the video. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Maynard Edwards, 32nd degree KCCH, Scottish Rite Freemason. Thank you so much for being a part of our journey here. What we're doing on Symbols and Secrets is we're looking at all the various symbols inside the Lost Symbol TV show and saying, yes, this is a Masonic symbol. No, that's not a Masonic symbol. Or this is a symbol Masons use. It's kind of quasi-Masonic. And we're separating some of the, the fact from the fiction because these writers have done a tremendous job of using Freemasonry as a backdrop to tell their story. And it's a great story. And they've blurred that line between fiction and reality so much that we want to enjoy the show and have some fun with that. But we also want to tell you what the real deal is. So watch the show and then come on back here and we're going to break it down for you after every episode. We've got to get into episode number six, which is Diophatine Pseudonym. That's the title. Diophatine refers to a mathematical equation that has two or more variables. Math nerds, if I'm screwing that up, please drop a comment below, but I believe that's what it is. And pseudonym, of course, means pen name. On our last review for episode five, I mentioned a pen name and uh, that pen name has reared its head in this episode so we're going to talk about that in a few minutes but let's get going here with this first clip it's uh, pretty powerful It is a well-known fact that all Masons, when they become Master Masons, and that they, they learn a special breathing technique that allows them to expel poisons and things from their body, and yes, bullets. This is why there are so many older Masons around. Okay, that's, that's not true. <laughs> that's, uh, that's not true. That's not even why I stopped this clip. But I stopped it because of the ink on Malak's back. That creature coming out of the five-pointed star there, I believe, is Baphomet. Now, Baphomet has no actual relation to Freemasonry. Baphomet is this fake deity that the Knights Templar were accused of worshiping back in the early 1300s. What actually was happening is that Pope Clement V and Philip the Fair of France, they didn't like the Knights Templar. Now, Clement V thought they were a threat to his power, and Philip the Fair, he, he owed him a bunch of money because he had fought a really expensive war with England that, that wasn't really going well, and the Templars wanted their cash back, and the Pope didn't like the Templars being a threat to them. So the Templars were declared heretics, and on Friday, October 13th, 1307, all hell started breaking loose for the Templars. They were ordered disbanded. They were all rounded up, accused of worshiping these false idols. Baphomet was one of them. And eventually a bunch of them were tortured. A bunch of them were uh, burned at the stake. And then that's where the genesis of Baphomet comes from. Its connection to Freemasonry comes through the Templars. In 1740, a guy named Chevalier Ramsey decided that there was some sort of connection between the Templars 
and Freemasonry. Now, this is not true, and in the very next video on Symbols and Secrets, Art de Hoyas and I sit down and talk about that connection, and we go a little further into that authentic versus romantic history of Freemasonry, but it is through the Knights Templar that Baphomet gets connected to Freemasonry. Now, how does that happen? I'm glad you asked. In the 1870s and 1880s, a guy by the name of Leo Taxel, that's not his real name, uh, he was making money in some not nice ways. First of all, he was a pornographer. He was, he, was, he was making naughty drawings and selling them and also writing some really anti-Catholic pamphlets and brochures and things and selling those as well. And, you know, kind of like magazines of the day, but these were really, you know, talking about how terrible the Catholic Church was. And mostly it was filled with lies. And let's face it, as we all know, anybody who's been to the grocery store knows that there's no shortage of people willing to buy complete lies uh, just for something to read. Uh, Leo Taxel was selling these anti-Catholic things, a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment in France at the time. And Leo eventually you know, the church is kind of ticked about this and they, they go after him. And he says, well, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I take it all back. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean any of this. It's these nasty Masons. They made me do this. They're bad people. And they worship this guy called Baphomet. And so then instead of writing anti-Catholic brochures, he switches over to writing anti-Masonic brochures. It perpetrated what we call the Taxel hoax. And because of the Taxel hoax, the Catholic Church to this day still is not okay with Catholics joining Masonic lodges. Freemasonry has no problem with the Catholic Church. There are many men that I know personally that are Catholic and Masons. And this all gets linked through this guy Baphomet. So there's no actual connection between Freemasonry and Baphomet. It's all made up and there was no actual connection between the Templars and Baphomet. That was made up as well. And the Catholic Church did eventually get around to pardoning or acknowledging that the Templars were falsely accused. Now, it didn't happen until like 2004, but you know, better late than never, I suppose. So who is the widow's son anyway? Sorry to use your Masonic bat signal when I'm not part of the Brotherhood, but it was urgent. The Widow's Son. A lot of people, Masons included, think that this is, ooh, this is really super secret Mason stuff. It's actually in the Bible, Book of Kings, chapter 7, where we learn of a guy named Hiram Abiff, who was the son of the widow of the tribe of Naphtali. And there's a little more detail in him, but essentially Hiram Abiff is one of the main characters in one of our Masonic allegories. There is actually a motorcycle club, nationwide motorcycle club, called the Widow's Sons. They do a lot of charity work, they do a lot of rides, and it's just another excuse for Masons to get together and hang out. So, not a secret, because they all wear vests that say Widow's Sons right on them. So, you know, how secret is it? Let's address this so-called Masonic bat signal, and I love that she called it that. Is there a way that Masons can let each other know when they're in trouble and things like that? Yeah, there is, and you know what? I will tell you, if you were to walk into a room of Masons and shout something out, shout out a password or something like that, we just look at you like you were an idiot, because it's not just about those little words and, and, and handshakes and things like that. It, there's sort of an etiquette to it all, and if you don't know that, and there wouldn't be any way you could just read that and know it, it's something you have to experience firsthand, you're not gonna be able to sneak your way into anything, so just don't bother with that. And like, if you walk in front of me and you shout out some sort of Masonic password or something like that, I'm not gonna beat you up. That's, I didn't promise that I would kick the butt of anybody who said it that shouldn't. I just promised I wouldn't say it. When Masons are in trouble and they need to get in touch with each other, I'm gonna show you how that's done. Boom, cell phone, it's the easiest way. I mean, really, this idea of, of, of a bat signal is, is foolish. But here you go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove to you how quick it works because we do have this connection. Uh, text my buddy Dave, uh, bro, call me ASAP. 
So uh, I've just reached out to him and I guarantee, there he is. <laughs> hey man. Hey bro, what's up, everything good? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry to alarm you. I, um, I'm doing one of my YouTube videos and uh, just explaining how Masons kind of get in touch with each other by, you know, basically normal communication. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to worry you or anything. No, no alarm at all, man. You can call me anytime for anything, bro. Cool, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. So Masons really just get in touch with each other in normal ways. The guys in my lodge, they are absolutely my, my best friends in the world. I didn't even know who they were. 10 years ago, but now I can't imagine my life without them. And, and we have this very solid commitment. And the cool thing is that these are men from all walks of life. I've got one guy who is a city planner studying for his PhD. You know, I'm a, a rock and roll DJ. And then we've got uh, my buddy uh, Dave, who is a, a railroad engineer. And we've got a guy who's an attorney, one guy who's retired military that works as a civilian contractor now. My main catechism instructor is a retired state trooper and navy officer. I mean, they, I mean, so men literally from every walk of life, they come together, they kneel at that same altar, and they say, okay, you're my brother and I'm yours. And that is why this is such a powerful experience. Man, I gotta tell you, that's beautiful. <laughs> Dude, I, <laughs> I thought you, what, what are you still doing on here? No, nah, I wanted to hear what you said. You know I love the videos that you do. No, man, you, you gotta listen to it on YouTube like everybody else. Jeez. Circumpunct. Eyeball carving in the box. It's a symbol, a circumpunct. I suspect it's another clue. A circumpunct symbolizes many things, most commonly uh, the eye of God. It's a symbol for the Egyptian sun deity, Ra. Sun is light. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's enlightenment, spiritual insight. Everything Robert Langdon just said about the circumpunct is 100% correct. Sign of enlightenment, symbol for the sun, all of that that he said, absolutely correct, absolutely used in lodges by Masons. We do it a little bit differently. First of all, we don't call it a circumpunct. We call it a certain point within a circle. Secondly, we add a couple of things to that. So we have the circle and the point within the middle, and then we add two parallel lines, and then on top, upon the top, we've got the Holy Scriptures. And this, in most instances, is the Holy Bible, but it's whatever holy book a brother reveres in his own life. So, why these extras? These are the boundary lines that we draw for ourselves. This point represents an individual brother. The circle and the boundary lines there, that's where he can't suffer his passions or prejudices to really betray his sensibilities. And the Holy Bible on top, the Holy Scriptures or the holy writings of his faith on top remind him that, you know, God and the Word of God is always paramount. Now, why do we have these extras on the circumpunct? Well, when you walk into a Masonic lodge, on the altar will be open the Holy Book, in most cases the Holy Bible in the U.S., but again, could be the Holy Book of whatever religion a brother practices, the square and the compasses. And what tools do you need to create this symbol? You need the square to draw those straight lines, you need the compasses to draw that circle, and of course you need that Holy Bible. So that's how that all comes together in Freemasonry. The Rose Cross, symbol of the Rosicrucians, ancient and mystical order, the Rosae Crucis. Secret hides within the order. The order of the Rose Cross? Perhaps. What's the secret? The Rosicrucian doctrine says that the order came from Truths from the ancient past, which offer great insight into a spiritual realm. Descartes, Pascal, Spinoza. Luminaries of the Renaissance. All Rosicrucians, as was Albrecht Dürer. Scientists, artists. Alchemists. The Rosicrucian founder was a German mystic and alchemist, uh, Christian Rosenkreutz. Later revealed to be Francis Bacon. Possibly Bacon, his actual identity still in question. But yes, e either way, Rosenkreutz was a pseudonym. Wow. When it comes to some seriously esoteric Masonic symbolism, 
these guys are going for it. And hey, writers, I mean, first of all, you're killing me because this one video is going to be like 30 minutes long. But second of all, this is something that is absolutely Masonic and specific to the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the degrees the 15th through the 18th, which are known as the Chapter of Rose Croy. Everything Robert Langdon said there, to the best of my knowledge, is accurate as to what Rosicrucianism is. I myself have not done a deep study on Rosicrucianism. I have heard the tale that I guess Sir Francis Bacon was somehow involved in that, but Sir Francis Bacon is tied to a lot of stuff. A lot of people think he wrote the plays of Shakespeare, which by the way, I don't believe at all. And that whole idea of Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry kind of being melded together is an interesting one. Uh, again, like the Knights Templar, I don't know that historically that that's accurate, but uh, there certainly is a romantic history that is attached to it. And this idea of the cube unfolding to show the cross is absolutely something that is taught in the 18th degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. This is not a Christian symbol. A lot of people will see that, oh, it's a hidden cross, it's a hidden Christian symbol. No, no, no. The cross predates Christianity by eons. You have to remember, the early church, in its effort to get more followers, was taking things from other religions that people liked and repurposing them to, to make it more familiar. That's why, uh, you know, Easter has eggs involved. It was an effort to get those pagans to, to take their spring holiday and turn it into, you know, more of a celebration of Christ. Same thing with Christmas. You know, that was the Yule Festival and, and a couple of other different holidays. And it was, it, was, it was couched in that way to get those pagans, again, to come on over to, uh, to, to Christ. And so similarly, the cross was also a symbol that has been around for centuries and centuries and centuries before the birth of Christianity and has a lot of different meanings. And this cube turning into the cross absolutely is used in Christian symbolism, but in a lot of other religions and uh, moral philosophies and uh, other things as well. So uh, this one is, is really a, a great one, and I, I really applaud them for using it. It's one of those things that it's tough to have a reasonable conversation about in a short period of time, which is what we have here. So I will get into Rosicrucianism to a degree that I can, in another video, but yeah, this symbol, absolutely taught in the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the 18th degree, and that is the, uh, the, the Rose Croix degree, and yes, that, that Rosicrucian philosophy and those ideas that Langdon discussed have absolutely been incorporated into Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Did I miss one? Is there something I said that you think as a Mason's like, ah, you're not right on that one, man. I wanna hear it. This is, this episode more than all the other episodes, spurs a lot of conversation because this, we're not just talking about this symbol means this and this symbol means that. We're talking about some real concepts here in Freemasonry that have to really be mulled over a bit. And it's important to have that be a conversation that's two-way. It's not just about what I say or what comes out of a book or what some somewhere some big master on high says. It's about you and me sitting down and talking and saying, this is what I think, what do you think? And you say, well, this is what I think. And then we can have that conversation. So please drop some comments below. Tell me what you thought about episode six, about some of the concepts that we've talked about in this video and share it with me, whether you're a Mason or not. And if you've got a question, by all means, please drop it in the comments section below. Don't forget to subscribe, turn on those notifications for the next time so when the newest video comes out, you can be one of the first to watch that. I'm Maynard Edwards. Thanks for joining me here on Symbols and Secrets, the viewer's guide to Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol on Peacock TV and PeacockTV.com.
Hey, if you're watching this video and you want to learn how to become a Freemason, click this video right here and it's going to give you a step-by-step -step process to follow on how to connect with a Masonic Lodge. And if you're already a Master Mason interested in joining the Scottish Rite, click this link right here and it's going to take you to the Scottish Rite website where you can sign up to become a Scottish Rite Mason right now.